Welcome, friends, to Grace Baptist Church. This is our Sunday evening service, September the 6th. And we do appreciate you tuning in on this Sunday afternoon. I hope you're having a great day. It's a beautiful day outside here in uh, Greensboro, Randleman area, where we are. And we do appreciate you tuning in. If you have your Bible, I'd like you to take it and turn, us, turn with us over to 1 Thessalonians chapter number four. We're going to be looking tonight, 1 Thessalonians chapter number four, the key to godliness, the key to godliness before the Lord comes. We talked a little bit about that this morning, coming back and looking at it a little bit again tonight. I really feel like the return of the Lord is right around the corner. Now, no man knows the day or the hour, but the way this world is getting, it just looks like uh, it can't go on much longer until the Lord comes back. Now, we do know that when he comes, there's seven years of tribulation, then a thousand years where he rules and reigns on this earth. But I believe he's going to come back and take us all. Those who know Christ, you'll be taken to heaven. And our dead loved ones, they'll be more alive than ever. And uh, the body comes up out of the grave the spirit comes down from heaven they reunite we're all together again it's called the rapture and we'll talk about that not tonight but maybe in a couple of weeks we'll look at that passage here in this chapter to the latter part of chapter number four but uh, let's take our bible and we'll turn there if you have it look with me if you will first thessalonians 4 verse number one paul is the writer and of course he's writing to a young church the church at Thessalonica, he only stayed there about three weeks. They ran him out of town. <laughs> and he started that church. And boy, it's doing great. He's writing back now just to make sure they're on the right track. He'd been hearing good things from the church. And he hasn't been gone too long since he writes this first letter. But uh, he writes to them to instruct them in being ready for the Lord to come because the Lord could come. So he says here, he's teaching on immorality and avoiding immorality has no place in the life of the Christian. We're to stay pure and clean with God's help. He washes us, he cleanses us, and now he puts our foot on the solid rock and our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So he helps us walk a pure life. And so that's what he exhorts us here in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse number one. Furthermore, then we, beseech you brethren, of course he's talking to Christians, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, says I'm speaking to you by the authority of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have received of us how you ought to walk and how you ought to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, can even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. All sexual sins are forbidden, he says. And then verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Then he goes on in verse 5, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. So he's given them an exhortation, a warning, stay close to God. Let God help you live a godly life. I mean, the Lord can come back at any time. When he does, he's gonna call us home and we wanna be ready, walking with him when he comes. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and get into our message, the key to godliness. Father, thank you again for this opportunity we have to share by the means, modern technology, the word of God. Bless each person that watches, I pray that God will learn to be more like our Savior Jesus, that we'll learn more and more from this precious book called the Bible. Lord, we love to study it. We love to read it. We love to heed it. And Lord, we do love to preach it and teach it. And so we pray tonight, as we look at this passage, it'll apply into our lives that will guard us from the booby traps Satan puts in our way. And Lord, that we would walk in the path that you've set for us and we'll give you the praise for it. Fill us with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, as I look at this passage and I see here Paul, he's talking to these Thessalonians. 
And he tells them, follow what I've taught you. And he's the one that planted the church. And then he gives added weight. He even appeals to the fact that, hey, I'm writing under the authority of Christ there in verse number one. And we like to look forward to the day when we're going to be caught up together with the Lord in the air. But my friends, in the meantime, we're walking down here on this earth and we need to walk in a way that would be pleasing unto the Lord. So Paul has already given his credentials. He is an apostle. He had actually seen the resurrected Christ in the flesh and he was willing to suffer physical abuse, mental anguish to establish this great church. As I said, he only stayed there about three weeks to start the church of Thessalonica. They tried to kill him. Some of the Jewish people there called the Judaizers. They thought he was a cult leader when really he was leading Christianity and Christ. And so they were going to kill him and they found out about it and let him down after dark over a wall in a basket. Paul escaped. And so now he's writing back and he's trying to encourage this young church. You've seen us. We were there for several weeks. Follow the teachings. Follow the word of God. Don't ever get complacent. You know and I know we can always grow even more in our faith in the Lord. God's been good to us. God loves us and he wants what's best for us. So he gives us a, a plan. It's found in the Bible. And so some have tried to discredit Paul's claim, discredit his apostleship. I mean, some of them had said, Paul, you weren't one of those men that Jesus walked with on this earth for three years. I never saw you with Peter, James, and John. And yet Paul clearly points out that a quick look back and those three weeks of ministry re would reveal to the believers there at Thessalonica that he was indeed a man of God. He was following God's plan for his life. And so he exhorts the believers, follow my example as I follow Christ. You know, that's a great way to live. Follow the example of Paul as he follows the example of Christ. That's what he's saying. Thank God for those wonderful, godly people that he puts in our life that we can follow and learn and grow and watch and observe how they serve the Lord and how they have the joy of the Lord. And they are our mentors, our teachers. And oh, it's a blessing to have them. I've had so many wonderful men and women in my life Oh, a lot of great preachers who have helped me tremendously. Thank God for that. Then he goes on, says, furthermore, that carries the idea remaining or the rest for the future or at last be ready. So we see from this term, Paul is getting ready now to summarize the teachings that he has given in these first three chapters. And so finally, at last, we're commanded, he says, to live a life pleasing to our Savior. So he begs and he encourages them by the authority of Christ that they would reject the paganism of the society in which they lived. Of course, they were living in an immoral Roman society. We'll have a little more to say about that in just a few moments. But he says, don't follow the ways of the Romans. Follow the ways of the Lord. Follow the ways of the Bible. We have seen down through the years, many that have started out for the Lord. and They were on fire, but somewhere they dropped right out of the race. And either went back into the evil influence of the world, or they just kind of sat over on the sidelines and can't get them back in church. And they won't hardly talk to you. And you wonder, what happened? What happened? <laughs> well, don't let Satan tempt you to abandon what you have seen in the life of our Savior Jesus Christ and all those wonderful people around you who are walking with Christ. And so we want to stay close to him. Never depart from the book. This book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the book. So the challenge from Paul that he teaches us that even those who think they're doing well in their spiritual growth, I mean, even those who feel as if they're very strong Christians need to be aware because they could fall too. I mean, Paul has commended them in the first three chapters, but now he wants to warn them. 
And we always have room for improvement, don't we? We never arrive. We never become super Christian. Uh, we're all sinners saved by the grace of God. And so he is encouraging them. You stay the course. Don't get sidetracked. Don't drop out. Don't be satisfied with your spiritual growth. Continue to strive. Continue to grow. Continue to follow the Lord. So when you study this verse, you notice Paul advocates that they would try to please God. Now, what does that mean? How could we please God? Well, I'm sure that your desire and purpose in life is to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord, or you wouldn't be tuned in tonight. The word for please there carries the idea to be agreeable to, uh, to, to seek to do what one would want, and that would be Jesus. So from the definition of this word, we could see that we're to be excited, to seek to be in agreement with what God commands in the scripture. God has revealed his will to us in the Bible. And the way to please God is to follow the Bible, follow the principles found in the word of God. It'll cut the bad out. It'll put the good in. That's what the word does. So we're to have that desire to obey the Lord. And it's an exciting moment when we surrender our lives and we're saved to the glory of God. And we've got a brand new life to live for Jesus. No better life than the Christian life. Maybe you're excited about pleasing God by pursuing godliness, following his word in your life. I believe that's what really pleases him. But then notice number two here, Paul said, verse number two, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Now he's reminding them he had given them the essential doctrines that Jesus had given him. We call them the Christian doctrine. These are commandments. These are not choices. <laughs> Notice what he said there. He said commandments. Some people think the Ten Commandments are ten choices. <laughs> and uh, they're not choices. They're given as commandments for a purpose. God has commanded us to do certain things and not to keep us from having fun or earthly thrills, but to give us the best life possible. So he reminds them of some of these commandments that he had given them with the direct authority of Jesus. Notice verse number three, for this is the will of God. So many people say, wonder what the will of God is for my life. This is one thing, mark it down. This is the will of God that ye abstain from fornication. See, a major problem that was plaguing the early church in Paul's day was immorality. They had these pagan religions. And they conducted immorality as a part of their religious rites in their temples. And Roman cultures knew no boundaries when it came to immorality. I mentioned in a message this morning, the man that cut Paul's head off, name was Nero. Nero, was just a young man, about 25 or 30 years of age. And he cut the head off of the apostle Paul and he would literally take the wives of his own soldiers. If he wanted them, take them home with him. And boy, they got so upset and jealous. And wives didn't have anything to say about it either. And so they caught him one night. History tells us that his own soldiers, his own bodyguards murdered Nero in a after dark in an alley because of what he had been doing to their wives and to their families. And so it didn't pay for Nero and it never has paid for anybody. God says, stay faithful to God. Stay faithful to your wife or your husband, your family, your children, your mom, your dad. And so he's urging these Thessalonians, they're very young in the Lord, but they're in the midst of a immoral society that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, let me read you a passage in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, 19, and 20. It says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know you not? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. We've been bought with a price, he says. So we're to glorify God in our body, and in our spirit, which are God's. Those are some strong words of warning coming from God 
and they given to help us in our life to live a life that is godly, live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. So if the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, which he does, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He will tell you when you get out of line. He will warn you when you get close to danger. Have you ever had something on the inside just say, stay away from that person? Stay away from that activity. Get back. There's some danger ahead. That's the Holy Spirit. He leads you. He leads you sometimes because he doesn't give you peace about something. If you don't have peace about it, don't go forward. Sit still until God clears it up. And again, be very careful about some of the ways of the world, the immorality, because there's a lot of people that just want to take down a good Christian man or a good Christian woman. And so he says here, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. He will guide you. He will help you to follow the pure ways of the Lord. And again, back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. The word sanctification means you have been set apart for a holy purpose. Doesn't mean you're sinless. There's no sinless people. Only Jesus was sinless. But thank God we're forgiven. And we're washed and cleansed by the blood of the lamb, the Bible said. We're saved. And so we should abstain, stay away from fornication, which means immorality of any kind. So he is alluding to the fact that God's will for sure is that we're set apart for a holy purpose. We have been sanctified. The word sanctified, as I said, means holiness, set apart for God's purpose. Now, and talks about the will of God. Do you know all of God's will? Uh, is It's in the word of God some way, somehow. Now, some things are not specifically spelled out, like what car should I buy or what person should I marry, but the principles are there. If you'll study the Bible, you'll get the mind of God and you'll be able through the Holy Spirit's leadership to make those right decisions, even if it's not directly named in the Bible. But I can assure you all of God's word is God's will. <laughs> I know I've faced this a few times where people say, well, preacher, I know what the Bible said, but I think God's leading me in a different direction. <laughs> and I always say, wait a minute, God's never changed his mind. He always preserves his word. It's been preserved for over 2,000 years. And he's not going to change his mind for you nor for me. If he put it in the Bible, that is God's will. That is God's standard. And so we think about the will of God. Sometimes the will of God includes sacrifice, suffering, the Bible said. The will of God always includes salvation. If you're not saved, God wants you to come to Christ and be saved. Trust his death, his burial, his resurrection. He's a living Savior. And he loves you dearly. He died in your place. So I know that's the will of God. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, the Bible said. Another area we know is God's will is that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Ephesians 5, 18, be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with God's Holy Spirit. We're to be submitted to God. We're to be settled. And so we're to be set apart from the things of the world, the sinful habits to the holiness of the Lord. And it's something we need his help with. Oh yes, there's pleasure in sin, it's only for a season. And we need to remember that God will give us strength if we'll just look for that escape. Every time you're tempted, there's gonna be a way to get out of it. Just look to God. He'll make a way of escape. As I said, in their, in their day, they had these immoral temples with temple prostitutes, and literally they had worship with immorality involved in it. And so the people would go to these temples and think uh, they were religious. And yet Paul said that's the furthest thing from pure Christianity that you could think of. Don't go back to those places. Turn a deaf ear toward that immorality. Stay close to your husband, your wife, your family, whoever God has given you. 
he has a will. He has a plan for them. And so Paul is teaching them to be different in our lifestyle than the world is. There is a difference between the Christian and the unsaved person. <laughs> and Paul saw it. He recognized there is a pull with the world and all the enticements of the world. And that's why he gives these strong warnings to the Thessalonians. He's saying, you've only been saved now a short time. But make sure every day, whether you've only been saved three weeks or a hundred years, make sure that you follow God's will. Every day, get up and every day follow him. So they were to do what God had called him to do and be pleasing in the Lord. Now, we can't do it on our own. We need God's strength. We need God's help. And so he infuses us with his power. He indwells us with the Holy Spirit. He sanctifies us with a life that is lived through the power of God. So he is giving these admonitions, pretty strong words to a young church, but he's doing it to try to help them, not hurt them, not keep them from fun, but to keep them in a joyful relationship with the one who loved them dearly. And so, He's saying in this passage, be very careful about the way we live. Stay away from immorality. It'll destroy your health. It'll destroy your family. It'll destroy your career, your conscience, your testimony for the Lord. And make sure that you stay with God. That word fornication comes from the word harlotry, pornea. We get the word uh, pornography from it today. It includes all physical sins of all natures. And the Bible said that it's only to be in the bonds of marriage that a person is to have physical relationship. Listen to Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed is undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Boy, those are strong words. <laughs> Heard about a guy reading his paper. His wife walked up behind him, smacked him right on the back of the head with a frying pan. He asked, honey, what in the world was that for? <laughs> well, I found a piece of paper in your pocket, and it said Betty Sue on it. He said, well, honey, don't you remember last week I went down to the horse track, and the horse I was betting on was named was Betty Sue, and she kind of shrugged her shoulders and walked off. Well, about a week later, she came back in there again, smacked him right on the back of the head with that frying pan again. He looked around and said, what was that for? His wife said, your horse, Betty Sue, just called. <laughs> Watch out. Get you in trouble, won't it? So what Paul is doing, he's giving the church a command. He's saying, walk with the commandments of God. He even tells a young preacher boy named Timothy. He told Timothy, flee youthful lust. Follow righteousness. 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Follow faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord with a pure heart. Joseph was a great example of this. You remember when Potiphar's wife tempted Joseph? The young man's only about 17. Potiphar's wife begged Joseph to come in and lie with her. And nobody would know, she said. Nobody else was around. But Joseph said, I couldn't do such a wicked act of immorality. That would be a sin not only against your husband, and you and me, but he said, it, it's a sin against God. Listen to Genesis 39, verse 7, 8, and 9. Came to pass after these things that his master, Potiphar's wife, cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said to him, come in here and lie down with me. And he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. But there is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. He said, he's put me in command of everything except for you because you're his wife. And so he says, how then can I do such great wickedness and sin against God? Now, Joseph ran away when she grabbed him and she grabbed his coat, came off of his back. But he left the scene. He got out of there as quick as he could because. She was up to no good, and he wanted to stay faithful to God, faithful to Potiphar. Yet, 
<laughs> we could say that she stole his coat, but thank God Joseph kept his character. Kept his character. And God blessed him for that. He became prime minister, second under Pharaoh. But it took about 13 more years. He was in prison that long. She lied on him. She said Joseph tried to force himself on her. And that was a lie. Then notice, if you will, back in our text, 1 Thessalonians 4, 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Of course, he's saying there, be very careful with our body and our vessel, maybe even our spouse, because it's a special relationship, a husband and a wife. And so he's saying, keep it clean, keep it pure, keep your thought life pure, keep your thought life clean. Don't let anything come between you and the Lord. The idea here is marriage is a holy union. The husband's to glorify the wife and help her with dignity and abstain from all fleshly desires and immorality that the world would throw at him. And God will be honored with that. And so Paul tells these Thessalonians, you're living in a very promiscuous society but this is God's way, and that's the way of holiness. It's the best way. Then notice verse number five. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. The key to that verse is found in what does it mean, concupiscence? Well, we normally don't employ that word today, but its significance is found in its definition. The word literally means desire or craving or longing or desiring for that which is forbidden, like lusting after something that's wrong. So Paul is saying here, there's a battle going on in the life of every Christian. And it's the battle of the flesh and the spirit. And the Holy Spirit says, stay faithful to your mate. And of course, we know that the flesh says, well, you don't have to do that. You can run with the crowd and live it up and party. And so which one's going to win? The one we feed the most. If we feed the fleshly nature through the wrong things, it's going to win out. But if we feed the Holy Spirit through prayer and the word of God and church and fellowship with Christian believers, it's going to win out. Galatians 5, 16 says this, walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So when we walk in the spirit and follow his leadership in our life, he'll never lead us contrary to the word of God. He'll always empower us. And listen to how Paul explained this in Galatians 2, verse number 20. Paul said, it's not me, it's Christ in me doing this. And that's why I say we're not strong enough to live the Christian life, but it's Christ in us living his life out through us. Here's what it says. Galatians 2, 20, I'm crucified with Christ, Paul said. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. <laughs> Woo, thank God for that life-changing power. We do not have to hang on the end of the devil's strings like a puppet. We are new creatures, new creations in Christ. We have a dynamite power to walk in holiness with the Lord. Paul is saying there, we're called to live a life that is anchored in the word of God, faithful to our Lord, faithful to our families, faithful to our Christian testimony. We please the Lord by following him in the light of his word, and he'll always guide us down the right path. Thank you so much for listening, and let's pray at this time. Father, again, as we have looked at your word, teach us, strengthen us, that we would follow in your footsteps, that we would honor you in all that we say and do, that we would put you first and foremost. And Lord, do I just pray for everyone that hears this message, that it would be a help to us, a strength to us. And Father, we know that you are a forgiving God, and we pray that Lord, that you would help us to always seek your will for our lives. Father, we love you and thank you for Jesus, who was willing to die on that cross for our sins. 
Lord, I know it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, thank you again so much for tuning in to the Grace Baptist Church this evening. I hope you have a rest of your good week. Come see us at Grace. We have one service on Sunday morning at 10. And we are going to have a homecoming service here this next Sunday morning. We're going to have some special activities 10 o'clock next Sunday. And until then, may God richly bless you.